Oh, I see one person. Ned's here with us. Let's see who else will make it in. We still have a couple minutes. Cheryl and Marianne. And Zora. Carolina's here. Just a few more seconds and we'll be getting started. Tony's here. Hi, Tony. All right. Now go ahead and get us going. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. We are going to be discussing whether to disclose or not to disclose. That's the question. Um, how to include your disability in a job interview and the initial callback for a job in a way that presents you as a whole person and in the best possible light. Um, my name is Thomas Stivers and I'm here on behalf of the Austin Lighthouse and I'd like to thank um, Dr. Laurel Miller and Northwest Hills Eye Care for uh, helping us get these webinars started. Uh, with me today on our panel, I have our two vocational services uh, instructors from the Austin Lighthouse, Robert Majewski and Isa Kamara, as well as our uh, accessibility, accessibility and data specialist, Dan Hart. Um, Dan also has some experience working in the vocational services field. We're all going to sp speak a bit about um, finding employment as a blind person and more specifically, how to disclose your disability in a positive way. Um, it's often a, a big challenge to figure out how do I want to do this. Uh, some people such as myself who are, who are totally blind, um, as soon as I walk into an interview, disclosure is kind of done for me. Um, I don't make really a decision about that. It happens as soon as that cane comes through the front door. Um, so I've got to make the decision right then and there to make that a positive experience for the receptionist I meet, for the interviewer, for myself, for basically everyone that um, is involved in the process of me getting employment. Um, before I even go to the interview though, um, before probably I, I will wait till I get a call back, but once I have heard, hey, we, we're interested, we'd like to meet you and get to know you a little bit better, um, then I'm going to plan my first visit before the interview and try to get kind of a orientation to where I'm going to go. I'll probably take my wife or a friend or someone who can, um, who I trust to give me um, a good description of the layout of the place um, so that when I actually go in for the interview, I don't need some special assistance. I can just walk in the door uh, and be pretty confident that I know what what is where, where the receptionist is, uh, where I'm probably going to be heading back for the interview to minimize that confusion as soon as I show up. Um, personally, when I receive that call that says, Mr. Stivers, uh, we'd like to, your resume has interest, interested us. We'd like to speak to you a little bit more. Uh, can you come in for an interview on Friday at nine? Yes, I certainly can. And I personally am not going to choose to disclose that I'm a blind person at that moment. Um, there may be some advantages and disadvantages to that decision. Um, and we'll go ahead and start with uh, Bobby Mazieski, who's going to talk about why it might be important 
as an employer, oh, I, I forgot some of, before I pass it off to Bobby, I forgot some of the basics that I like to mention at the very beginning. Sorry about that. Um, if you would like to raise your hand on the PC, press Alt-Y, um, or on the phone, press star nine on a telephone keypad. Uh, same thing to lower your hand. Uh, and to unmute yourself, uh, press star six on the phone or alt A on the PC. Um, in this particular webinar, we will be accepting questions throughout uh, and wherever we reach a pause, uh, we'll be glad to take questions or comments uh, from attendees. Uh, we're looking to have a little more of a round table type discussion um, for this presentation. So Bobby, would you uh, tell us a little bit about why I might want to disclose my disability right up front when I first get that call back for a position? Absolutely, you can hear me, correct? Yes, sir. All right, so thanks you all for being here. And uh, you might wanna disclose on the phone because at that point, you know that you made a good resume, they liked it, and they're calling you for an interview. They're not gonna, retract it right there if you say you're blind and if you say you're blind or we'll stay with blind but if you if you disclose your disability you can eliminate walking in there and the interviewer and interviewee interviewer thinking that you were hiding that from them you can disclose that and the interviewer can in the best case scenarios go, oh wow, what could I do to possibly make this experience work? That would be the best case scenario. You can also start alleviating any of the worries you may think they have when they find out eventually that you have a disability. Like you can say, I'm blind if, if you have any papers or things for me to read, you could send them electronically. I can do this, that, and the other thing, and that'll be fine. Um, it's just a open and honest way to start that relationship with the employer. It also gives them, if they just go, oh, okay, we'll see you at nine, and they a little apprehensive or scared, they don't know what to do, it gives them a couple days to mill it over in their minds, think about it. Maybe they're worried, maybe they're not worried. But then by the time you go in there, you're prepared to alleviate any sort of barriers that they, you think they may think you're gonna have to do that job. So, that's why you would disclose it on the phone call. So Bobby, a um, couple just thoughts I have to, to maybe ask. Um, what, what would you expect, like what would your concerns be um, as somebody who is sighted, uh, as if you found out that I, I do have a visual impairment and I let you know that right up front, um, what would your initial thought be, do you think, um, that I should consider trying to address right there on the phone um, immediately? You mentioned uh, handling any documentation or paperwork, assessments, that type of thing. How um, you're are gonna there get concerns? there? How you're gonna get there? Um, okay. Are you gonna bring someone? Am I? Is... And so I would, addressing, a transfer, addressing transportation uh, that I'll be providing my own transportation. Um, and I don't need to necessarily say what it's going to be, that it's a Metro access bus or a capital Metro city bus, an Uber, a Lyft, or a family member. I can just say, state then I would provide, I'll be providing my own transportation uh, would be my sort of answer to that question. Are there other questions you would think to ask right there at the, at the front? If you, um, you're interested in maybe hiring a blind person, but You've never thought about it until this very moment. I, as an employer, would probably, if I had never encountered a blind person at all, 
would know that I can't ask any questions at this point, like, how are you going to do that job? <laughs> is or I start, I would honestly, you'd start thinking about all the barriers to mm -hmm. the job. And that's why disclosing it on the phone might put them at ease mm -hmm. and they might get excited about it after that, as opposed to just my experience with people that have never worked with visually impaired individuals, their mind goes to the way to whatever side they're going at. It's, you know what I mean? Like, and you're, so you're saying your perspective on it is that when somebody walks in the door at, that's blind, the, the person may kind of have a moment of shock of what do I even do? And so and that might have some that, time to let that pass, it might be yeah. a more valuable experience. Yeah, and walking in and they're like, well, I had no idea. They're thinking, and you're, I, I had no idea I was blind. It might throw off the whole interview and it might not. I mean, like, but theoretically it could. And, the, and then that interviewer is only thinking about that at that particular time while you're in the interview, as opposed to several days before you even got there. And they could easily realize after you disclose it on the phone, once you get there, like, wow, this, I, this is no big deal. <laughs> okay. So you think that it might allow the, your qualifications to be the topic of the interview? Yes. Um, because the, the person has had time to maybe think through um, the idea of a blind person working with them um, Absolutely. for a little bit of time. Okay. I can understand that. Um, I, I, I'm glad to, to sort of know that, because it would not occur to me right off the top of my head to talk about how I'm going to get there. Because uh, I just assume, of course, I'll take care of that. Um, but if that's something that's occurring to that potential employer, it's important to uh, make it clear that transportation is not going to be a problem for me. And here's how, you know, I'll, I, I will be providing my own transportation. I have a proven track record of Attendance, I'm always on time. Uh, and, and this, this is something kind of I didn't think of when we were talking about this, but like you, you're just talking about the transportation and don't worry, all your whole statements would be don't worry, don't worry. And what employer doesn't want his employees to not, to not have them worry about anything. So like, oh my God, the visually impaired guy is always telling me I shouldn't worry about anything. And you know what? I shouldn't because he or she's got it covered. Because <laughs> he started out like that from the day I talked to him on the phone. Right, right. All right. Well, that is that is one perspective. Um, I'm, I. It's something to think about. It's definitely given me some uh, things to consider. Um, I know Isa, you have uh, maybe some a different idea of when it when the best time might be to bring up um, blindness, and you've I know you can speak a bit to why you might not want to bring it up right there on that initial callback. Yes. I would like to start off with saying there is no right answer. It depends on the individual and your circumstances, but I would like to get to address some of the topics and examples that you guys brought up. Like you should tell them because you're letting them know not to worry that you, you can make it there. Well, if you arrive on time to the interview, you already proved to them that you can make it there, that you have your own transportation. Action speaks louder than words. Um, the other thing is that, like the ADA says, you do not have to disclose your disability prior to you accepting the job prior to the offer. Now, you change when you, when you tell them on the call and you're explaining, oh yes, I can make it there, don't worry, I, I got transportation and, and um, I'm letting you know I'm blind. You already changed the topic to your disability. You made it focus on your disability. And so now you're trying to prove yourself before you even make it to the interview. Well, anybody else who is not disabled or any, they wouldn't disclose anything else 
So it's like, yes, I can be there. Thank you very much. So, and I wouldn't want to work for an employer if I didn't tell him over the phone that I was blind, that if he or she believes that, oh, wait, this person is sneaky or devious because they didn't tell me that I, they were blind over the phone, then that might be an employer that I wouldn't want to work for. Because, and then that they would have to make all these other extra accommodations and adjustments just prior to the interview, as well as um, if the job does not have the title driver in it, then <laughs> I should have to tell them that I'm blind on the on just the out at the call. You have anything about that, Thomas? Or Bobby? No, those are good points. And like you said, there is no right answer. It's just the right answer for what whoever is comfortable with. But yeah, those are good points. Yes, because when you're letting them know, okay, we we you're one of the chosen. We want you to show up at this time. And then you're just saying, hey, I'm blind. I don't think, to me, I don't think it'll benefit anyone at all. I don't see the benefits in that. So Issa, your kind of perspective there is that if you say something, if you say that you're blind and it doesn't bother them, then it wasn't probably gonna bother them if you showed up to the interview as a blind person. Yes. And if, you, if you say it and they have all these big concerns, then they're probably, you're, you know, the, the interview, is, the phone call or the interview are probably not going to be enough to cover all their concerns if, if it overwhelms them and they're not willing to consider you as a person uh, and are, are totally focused on the disability. Is that kind of where you're Yes, Thomas. To? Because, like, going back to you want to do, you want to focus on your abilities in the interview. You're not focusing on your abilities at the call by stating that you're blind. So you're, you're taken away from your abilities then. And then also an employer probably might not have any problem with hiring somebody blind, but now you told them and now they're overthinking things, <laughs> yeah. consulting with other people. You know, there's a lot of different things. I just don't really see the benefits of before I come there that I need to tell you. And it goes on like it depends on the individual when when they feel comfortable. For like someone like you, if you're totally blind, when you get there, they know you're blind. Okay, and like you said earlier, you try to um, make it a a good experience for the interviewer. I don't want to have to make that a good experience over the phone before I even show up for the interview. And, and the person you speak to on the phone may not even be your interviewer. Exactly. Could, could just be somebody they've delegated the task of making callbacks to. Um, so that, those are some, some good thoughts. I think both sides have, have their merits um, and are worth considering. And Thomas, um, and so then now, some, like for your point, you did disclose your disability to somebody who does not should know that information. Mm -hmm. that yeah, they may not, the person I disclosed to on the, that initial phone call, uh, they may not know sort of the regulations and, uh, you know, they may not be familiar with good hiring practices and HR regulations. So that may, they may start laughing in the break room saying, would you believe we got a, we got a call from a blind dude who thinks he can work here? Um, that's probably not a good thing for you um, because that, you know, and if the interviewer is hearing that kind of thing, even just in passing, it may put, put thoughts you don't want them to, to necessarily have before you can even address them. Um, so those are some good thoughts. Um, so we've got, we've made our decision. We've either disclosed or we haven't during this phone call. Um, and we're going to come on in and, um, sit for this interview. Um, Bobby, can you speak to some of the, the major concerns that, in your experience, people who are um, blind or visually impaired 
need to think about when they're just coming in for the interview, some techniques to ensure a, a good interview? Well, other than just dressing nice, bare minimum, minimum, nice shirt, tie, nice slacks, shoes, dress skirt, a little bit businessier job would be full suit, but walk in with confidence. Most of the time you're gonna get a receptionist or someone that has you sit down and wait. Obvi obviously always be nice. You don't have to chit chat too much. Please and thank you. They offer you anything to drink, just like everyone else. No, if offer you want a donut or something, no, don't be chewing gum. Don't just smoke a cigarette outside the door, especially if you're visually impaired. You would have to, like, you don't know when they start watching you. Like, I'm not visually impaired. I could say, well, I can go around this corner. I can just do whatever. <laughs> but, like, you don't know if you're visually impaired. So, confidence. If you have a chance to get in that building and see kind of the layout so that confidence can be better on that day of the interview, or like Thomas was saying, have someone come in, go in with you. Anything you can do to get more information about the situation you're going in is always going to benefit you. Research the, the company. Keep everything you say to anyone else about just you're there for the interview. You're not talking about your weekend. You're just there for business and that's it. When you're in the interview, answer the question. Yes, no, never yes or no, and never, and just enough information. How do you think you can do this work? Well, my experience is this, that, and other thing, and then that's it. Don't keep going on and on and on. And if there's a pause, pauses are fine. Don't think you have to be the one to start talking. Just be confident because by the time you go in there for the interview, you already made a really nice resume. You know that person looked at it, liked it enough to meet you. And that interview is to reiterate your abilities to the interview because that's what the questions are usually about. But it, it really is for them to see you as a person and your personality to see if you're going to fit with the other workers or with the business that they have. Someone else might be super qualified, but they just don't seem like they're gonna fit with the other people. They'll take the person that they can teach and is less qualified if it's the personality is gonna fit. Cause that's what they really want. Cause you know they already like you and they already believe you have enough experience to do that job. Those are some good practices. Please and thank yous, thank you for meeting me and the confidence is important as well. One personal experience that I have that kind of ties into that, you mentioned um, specifically don't jump in and chat up the um, person working the desk where you've come in. Um, that was a job I did for a while and I did have interview candidates who came in and talked to me. Um, and sometimes they would tell me all kinds of things. and. Um, for one thing, there's a good chance I was busy on something else. Um, but when that interviewee is there, they're a guest. And my, one of my primary roles in that front desk uh, position is to be polite and respectful to guests. And they're, you know, they're kind of my customer. So they're always right. And I'm going to do whatever it, it takes to keep the guests happy. Um, but if they're there for an interview, chances are as soon as they finish that interview and, and go in, they meet the hiring manager, they wrap it up, there's a good chance that hiring manager is gonna talk to me about that and say, hey, so they were out here, how, they were out here for a good 15 minutes before they came in to see me. Uh, did you guys talk about anything? And if, if that interviewee was a difficult person, 
even though I treated him as nice as could be and butter wasn't going to melt in my mouth because I was being a sweetheart to him, I'm going to tell that manager, uh, they told me how drunk they got last weekend, uh, how drunk they get every weekend, and how this job is just going to be a way for them to afford the, you know, the lifestyle they want to live. I don't think they're a good fit here. Um, if I've been a good receptionist or, uh, or clerk to, to that manager, I'm probably going to have some pull and that person may not have get that job just because of their attitude in the office. You're right. This is Bobby. Um, I, my first job in Austin, the receptionist made or break or broke a bunch of interviewers just because that exact reason, because they will talk. <laughs> and that's part of their role. Honestly, they're the first, one of the first sort of lines of defense, you want to figure out what this person is like when they don't feel like they're on the hot seat and when they're just being natural. Because everybody knows to, to play it up in the interview, but it's what you say before that that, that um, might differentiate you. Thomas? Yes, sir. I would like to add something to that. This is Esau again. The, um, and I'm glad you brought that up because depending on companies and a lot of companies are using it a lot more now than they did back then, back in like, you know, 30, 40 years ago, but your interview process starts at first contact of the employer that you're applying for. So if this was back in the day when you walk in and ask for an application, you should be ready for an interview. That is part of your interview. You need to be dressed appropriately for that job and conduct, conduct yourself in a correct manner. That right there from when you pick up the application, when you call to follow up on your on your job, you it's like you need to be treated just like it's an interview. And some places they screen you at the receptionist, just like Thomas said, the receptionist is supposed to give you great customer service, but they're screening you. Some applications get thrown away before you, before it even goes to the hiring manager because you, you flunk some of the, some of the tests that they have at the front desk when you first applied. Like you came in there with some house shoes or some slides or whatever, just to drop off the application. That receptionist or whoever will toss it in the trash because that's what they were instructed to do. So anytime, as soon as you get to the job site, the interview starts right there in the parking lot. Conduct yourself like you're on an interview from every contact. Go ahead, um, Thomas or Bobby. Hey, uh, this is Dan. Can I hop in here for a second yes, on sir. that? All Go right. Hey, so this is Dan Hart. Hey, Issa brings up a great point. Uh, I have worked with folks both in a vocational role such as uh, where Bobby and Issa are working with folks now. And I've also been a part of the hiring process for folks within, uh, within companies. What you just said, Issa, is very, very important. You'd be surprised at how people turn in applications. I have seen applications come in with dirt, with chicken soup, with orange chicken, with last night's dinner. I've seen it to where it looks like they crumpled it up in a ball and just tried to smooth it out. That's very, very important. If you're handing in an, a, a, a paper application and or you have a paper resume cover letter, make sure those things are nice and neat because that is a representation of you. Uh, if on your you're handing in a, a a paper application, if you can type it, if you have to have it filled out by hand, have somebody help you out that has very very good handwriting. If you're not able to write very well, that is uh, that is very very important. So I'll that pass applies, it back to you, Thomas. That a, a similar concept there applies with your electronic resume and application as well. Many jobs, I would almost say most jobs nowadays expect you to fill out an online application. Um, it's important that when you do that, that application reflect 
um, your professionalism, your attention to detail. Um, so if you, on your resume, make sure it's, I, I, I hope this is obvious, but make sure it's spelled correctly. Um, make sure the grammar makes sense on your resume where you're stating your objective or you're describing the duties you performed. Um, try, to, try to follow some sort of consistent guidelines as far as how you're going to represent yourself. Don't um, make, don't allow misspellings and, and tiny little details, typos on, on a resume or a job application to be the thing that makes you as a whole person be rejected for a position. Um, same is true just on a job application. If you misspell the name of the high school you went to, uh, it's, it's really easy to say, well, you know, I need somebody who can uh, error correct my work. And this person didn't even error correct their work. Uh, so they may not be the one for me for this job. So keep that in mind. Um, so once you've gotten to, and, and again, I just remind everybody and anybody that has questions, please raise a hand and we'll, um, we'll bring you in. Um, once, you, once you get to that interview, um, especially for me, I am going to, uh, you could call it, visually disclose. As soon as I walk in that door, the cane has disclosed for me. Um, and so I'm not going to take a lot of the receptionist's time and energy and attention, um, but I am going to um, do my best to fit in and um, walk in, greet them politely, uh, identify my chair. My O&M skills are going to be critical for doing that, finding a, a proper place to wait and not just stand by the desk. Uh, I have definitely uh, had some people do that. Just stand right in front of my desk. I'm here for my interview and they're just waiting, right? There's a chair to your left, sir. Okay. And if that's all they say, it's one thing. But um, if, that, if there's a whole scene as you try to locate that chair to the left, um, that's going to reflect poorly throughout the process. Um, also, when I when I walk into the interviewer's office, um, I'm listening very closely to figure out how they're reacting to me. Um, when I walk in, are they moving furniture around or um, trying to get things out of my way? That kind of thing. I, that's a that's something I'm going to either have to address or acknowledge that this may already be a challenging interview because um, they're not seeing a person, they're seeing basically the disability and I've got to get past that uh, pretty quickly. Um, for me, I feel like once I do get into the interview uh, office, uh, bringing up my disability and uh, speaking about it pretty early on is important because I would like to open the door for the interviewer to ask the, all the questions that Bobby was discussing earlier that they might be thinking. I want them to ask me those questions early on, get them out of the way and, and focus on my uh, abilities, the, the things from my resume, my uh, employment history, experience I have and so forth. Um, but I need, I need to give them the opportunity to consider me as a whole person and the disability, the blindness is part of that for me. Um, so it's very important that, that that interviewer have the opportunity, which only I can give them. I have to say, you know, I'm, I am legally blind and I, I welcome any questions you have about how that's going to affect my ability to do the job. Uh, if, I, if I felt like it would have any negative impact on my ability to do the job, I wouldn't have applied for you, but um, I know you're, you're not permitted to ask me that question up front, um, but I want you to ask me questions about how it will affect my duties. And, um, and most interviewers are going to ask questions. The ones that don't are the ones that tend to be a problem because uh, they're going to conduct most of the interview based on their assumptions. And um, many people who haven't interacted with blind people before have some pretty incorrect assumptions about the capacity of people who are blind. Um, the, you know, the popular culture representations of blindness may not be the greatest. Um, and so you've got to overcome some of that um, at some point in this interview process. Um, for me, that's going to 
I want to try to downplay it as much as I can and make it not the entire focus of the interview. Uh, if you find that that has happened, uh, you can pretty much walk out knowing that, well, I had a good experience, I had an interesting conversation, but I didn't get the job. Um, they need to ask you about skills. They need to ask you the set of questions that they would ask any other job candidate. Um, and so you need to give the chance to cover the disability specific stuff, but try to keep directing wherever you can back to um, job skills, um, the duties to be expected, your experiences, how you are the best candidate for the position. Um, not only in spite of your disability, but maybe even because of it. Um, I think that's a, that's a critical approach to take when you're actually sitting there having the interview. Um, next, I would, I'd like uh, to have Issa speak a little bit about his experiences as somebody who um, can, can walk into the office and maybe not even be perceived as having a disability. The receptionist might not notice the interviewer might not notice, or they might. Um, so how, how do you sort of handle that scenario, Issa, where somebody, where you could get away with not saying anything? Uh, how does that work for you? Okay, yes, we can get into that. And um, to tap on one thing that you said, Thomas, about an interview can be challenging if somebody's moving furniture around and stuff. Well, some. I go in as all interviews will be challenging because a lot of people are not aware, do not have awareness of blindness, are not educated on blindness. So some of these people will, might be great coworkers or a great employer. You can't expect everyone to understand blindness. You will struggle with that with friends and family and they'll know you're blind and you still have to keep educating them. But Getting into the disclosure, I have had several different experiences on, with different eye conditions. At one point, I was totally blind. I'm not totally blind, legally blind, but can see good, well enough that no one would ever know I was blind and un unless I disclosed it. So, but... I did have to wear sunglasses and sometimes I would wear the sunglasses going in, depending on what type of, um, how bright the day was, how, how much UV ray, ray lights we have, UV lights, how, how bright is the sun, all of that. They, uh, do they have a big window in front of the, the main door where a lot of sunlight's coming in. So, it was a lot of different. I had to go walk in and like and say, wait, do I need my sunglasses? Can I make it without my sunglasses? Or do I have to wear my sunglasses? So a technique that I used was that I walked in without my sunglasses. And then when the hiring supervisor comes to get me for the interview to retrieve me, I will go ahead and put my sunglasses on and let them know hey, I have sunglasses because of I have sensitive, um, my eyes are very sensitive to the light. And I can start some of the disclosure at that point. And it's all about getting the feel of when you want to, when you should. You feel in the person now, this person might, you know what, I think I can make it with the sunglasses, so now I'm going to bring it up and put my sunglasses on. But if I already had my sunglasses on and I needed them, there's no way I could have got out of it. Soon as I say hello, introduce myself, shake my, their hand, I will let them know it's why I have the sunglasses on. Now, at that point, there's different levels of disclosing. So at that, you know, I'm very sensitive to light. I need to wear, you know, sunglasses. You don't really have to say I'm legally blind you can bring that up a little bit later if you need to. But there's other times that my eyesight is really bad like it is now. I need to go in when I shake their hand, I let them know I'm legally blind. 
and going back to a lot of people who are not educated about blindness, when you tell them that you're legally blind, automatically they think you're totally blind or they're not really understanding how blind you are because you're looking at them, you're walking without a cane. So it's not registering yet. So lack of their education, I may use that against them of when I'm going to, or not using it against them, using it in my benefit of when I'm going to disclose to see how far ahead I can get in the interview what they're pretty much committing that, you know what, you're the guy we're going to hire. But um, there's other times when I, I can see a little bit better. So it, it doesn't really matter when it, they like to use a high partial, but somebody blind, visually impaired, it's all about how you feel and, and how you're reading the people who are interviewing you and when you feel comfortable with doing so. And, but there was a lot of different techniques that I did use and it was in the fast food. It was in um, sanitation. It was in all different wide ranges of, of, of occupations that you have to do all different kinds of things from working outside and working in warehouses. And I helped people, job coach people as well of when they're disclosed depending on, but it all depends on you. There's no right and there's no wrong. It all depends on you. But if you're going to use eyeglass sunglasses, it's best to, hey, I'm wearing sunglasses, not because that I think I'm cool. I like to wear sunglasses at night or anything. I need them because it affects my eyes, the, the bright light. I, um, excuse me, sir, um, I can get this paperwork filled out but I have my handheld CCTV here to use to help me fill this paperwork out. So a lot of times I use my independence and my different devices that I have to help me disclose my, my disability. That's the way I always went. Anything that they would say, what is he stumbling? Is he swerving? Did he not see that chair? He can't fill out this paperwork. He can't see that sign. Whatever it is that I need to do my job, I'm going to prove it to them that I can, my abilities with different devices or whatever I have, and that's how I disclose, by my by showing my independence and my abilities. Do you have anything, Bobby? No, that's good. Um, I've got, I've got, the moral of the story is talk about your abilities because it's yeah. not about your disability, even though I use my abilities yeah. to to disclose, you know, to, to 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 disclose my disability. Right, demonstrate your abilities uh, while you're disclosing, you know, any any uh, accommodations you may need. Dan, you had uh, something to put in. I do, Issa. You you said a lot of really really good touch points that I've I've used in the past again both as um, an interviewer and an interview e as an interview e it's very very important that you you get a good feel for who you're talking with are they do you think they'll understand things like my eyesight's 2200 I have tunnel vision or I have macular degeneration, whatever the case is, keep it very focused and very non-technical. I don't see very well. My eyes are sensitive to the light. Uh, I can see straight ahead, but I don't see anything to the side. Someone might not even know what peripheral vision means. So if you describe it in, in, in very, very uh, specific terms like that, that will definitely help to be able to kind of give a person a, a vision and a picture of how you see. If they do have, if any kind of questions come up or if you are disclosing, keep it again, very basic, keep it very narrow. And if the door's open to kind of answer some questions, again, keep it focused in. Immediately though, you want to follow up 
again with what I call the ability statement folks in both and I think Bobby Thomas and and EC all three of you have hit on this you need to have an ability statement and and some kind of material to talk about what are your abilities yes you're disclosing that you can't see very well but I can still do the job here's how I can do this job with these tools these reasonable accommodations with you know some kind of a tool this is what my ability is these are what my abilities are take the foot what you're doing there is you're taking the focus off of your disability you're you're putting the focus on you as a person on your skills and you're showing how you have overcome a barrier and in in a lot of instances i i have seen where folks have looked at me as a as a computer programmer by trade they can't believe that i'm able to 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 pound out code and have very little vision it's in in your you're opening up that door to be able to to again educate and and i think it was um either either bobby or isa one of you two had mentioned if you're gonna you come away from this interview if you don't get the interview you know that's 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 a very likely outcome for anybody but what you're doing what you're leaving behind hopefully is a good impression of someone that's got a disability and that can show that you know what i can overcome these barriers so that way that that fits in again with that education piece that we were talking about uh and i've always stressed that with folks that i've worked with as a as a vocational services uh specialist you know again education is is great uh and being able to leave a leave behind that education is is great so again just keep it focused keep it very narrow don't volunteer you don't want to volunteer your whole life story of i was diagnosed with rp when i was four and this is how it progressed just keep it very very focused on what you're doing or how how you're doing right now and how your eyesight is right now uh, yes Tom? dan dan i'm sorry thomas let me intervene here like yes everything that dan said but the key, the key to getting a job is you're feeling confident. If you feel confident that you're qualified and you have the skills to perform this job, to have this job, I'm not going in there with my blindness. I'm not thinking about my blindness. I'm thinking about I am a qualified candidate to perform this job. I am the best person for this job and for you to hire me. And that's what I'm going to show you every time you meet me or talk to me or when I'm in an interview. And you just, you demonstrate your abilities by disclosing your, your disability. I don't ever, oh, well, I can't really see this and I can't see that. No, whatever. If it's about, like you said, pounding code, Dan, I'm talking about the job. Oh yes, I've done this code and did this and that, and, and I'm doing this now. Currently I'm working on something now. That, oh what? You said you could do the code, you did it before, but you said you're currently working on it now. So, oh wow, he, so he's, he's, he can do this. Everything that focuses on selling yourself. And if you're qualified for the job, you apply for that job, and you go in as I am a qualified candidate that happens to be blind. Not that I'm blind and I'm coming here for a job. Go ahead, Thomas. So something that Dan is able to do with uh, writing code is um, show in, a lot, in some cases samples of his work or at least refer to samples of his work. Um, in any job where you can do that, either um, with programming, you can say, hey, I contributed to this open source project. Um, you can't do that necessarily with a lot of jobs, but you can refer to the, the previous experience you have, the work you've done, or the education you have, and uh, maybe a practicum you had in school, anything that sort of shows that despite this disability, you have done, um, done the job in question and are um, the best candidate. So we've kind of covered the, the 
phone call about the interview and coming in the door and the interview itself. Now, once you actually um, are offered a position, then it becomes a time that it is very important to um, disclose exactly what it is you're going to need to do to do the job. Um, because getting the job is more than half the battle, but not the whole battle. Uh, once you have the job, you have to be able to do it. Um, if I walked into a company that uh, wanted me to be a graphic designer and I, pl I gave a really good explanation of how graphic designers are, uh, do their work and uh, here's the experience I have and so forth and I, I put on a really good show in the interview, but then I walk in there and I can't actually do the job, uh, it's not going to work. So I need to be prepared to say, here, here are the tools that I have used to do the job that you have hired me for in, in other places. Um, here are other tools that maybe I haven't used that I know are available. Um, you know, here's what I can bring myself. Uh, here's what I might need your, your help as a company to, um, to provide for me. Um, here's what I might be able to get from other organizations whatever that might be, um, once you've been given that job offer and kind of are, are actually starting the job, um, it's very important that you advocate for yourself and say, I need to work in a well-lighted area. Uh, this, um, this basement corner office <laughs> is just not gonna work um, because I can't see to do the job here. Um, you know, and I, I, may I bring in uh, some extra lighting for my desk? or whatever it might be to ensure that um, you're going to be able to do the job once you've gotten it. Convincing the interviewer that you can is one thing, but then actually doing it in reality um, is, is kind of another thing. And um, if you need a screen reader, you know, say I can, I can do some work with narrator that's built into windows, but for uh, the most efficiency I might need to use, NVDA, or I might need to use uh, JAWS. And here's some ways that we could get JAWS um, either through saying, if, if, you, if you can get me into, if I can take some education credits with you, with a, with a school in the area, I can get a, a license for JAWS that I can use for work purposes or something to that effect. You know, find ways to uh, not present your employer exactly with a bill that says, I need you to go buy this software for me today, and it's the only option, uh, but try to present them with a couple of options and how uh, they can help you to be the most effective person that you can be uh, for the job that they've hired you for. Um, with that, um, now that we've, we've gone all the way through the process and we've gotten the job and we've got our accommodations, it sounds like we're probably ready to go. Um, in this imagine in this imaginary world, um, does does anybody have any specific questions that they'd like um, like to ask any of us about sort of the the hiring process or just um, their comments or observations that that you've experienced in in looking for work anything like that? Uh, we'd love to hear from our guests. Such a quiet crowd today. I have a question for Bobby. Okay. Go for it, Isa. Hey, Bobby, you, you're pretty much taking the employer role and what you would like for somebody to disclose that they're blind on the call. So if I get hired, can I ever threaten my employer about firing me because of my disability and take them to court? Probably, but what <laughs> get fired? I was just joking. <laughs> Everybody's so quiet. Wake up. <laughs> so, and uh, there is some some truth to that. Is um, <laughs> you you may it, there uh, most employers do know the law pretty well these days. You might find small organizations that don't, but most employers know uh, that you can't terminate someone solely because of their disability. Um, 
they know that they need to find, they need to demonstrate, they need to either terminate you without cause, in which case you can, you know, there's a whole file for unemployment and there's various concerns that employers prefer not to terminate people without cause, um, or they can terminate you by, for saying you're not able to perform the duties of the job. I hired, I hired Issa uh, to um, build, build houses and he can't uh, nail two boards together at a right angle. He can't build houses for me. Um, I'm not gonna bring up his disability at all. Um, and that's why it's so important that you be able to do the jobs you're hired to do. Um, and if you cannot do the job that you were hired to do, um, you've got to try to, you know, make arrangements with that employer. Um, or, you know, if it, when, when that termination comes, don't be terribly surprised if you can't do the job you were hired for. Because um, it's, it's definitely a possibility. Well, I, I saw a, a, a thank you from, the, from Carolina. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I think our next week's topic is going to be a really big one um, right now. Um, we're going to be talk or not next week. My apologies. It's going to be on the 30th uh, in two weeks. We're going to be talking about uh, delivery services for all kinds of goods, uh, how to get your groceries delivered, how to get um, fast food delivered or medications or um, whatever kinds of services that normally you might go out to uh, to get during the, the normal um, scheme of things. But right now in, in, with the pandemic, almost everybody is um, looking to have more and more things delivered and a lot more services are available that do deliveries um, right now. Um, we're going to have a little different panel then. We have a couple people who are very, uh, very strong users of delivery services um, and use a, a lot of different um, systems to, to get groceries and medications and everything else. Um, to Carolina, I saw your question uh, asking about social distance. We will sort of um, try to incorporate that as a as a additional piece when you do have to go somewhere um, you may not be able to see who's in your six foot bubble so how can we um, how can you as a blind person make sure that you're still maintaining that that space around you and with re in a respectful way when somebody comes up and grabs your shoulder to help you you can say no no what are you no don't <laughs> Don't do this. So we, that we will definitely bring that up um, in our next presentation. Um, just so you know, because I've been here for all of these, I will not be available next week. Um, Mr. Dan is going, Hart is going to be um, moderating the presentation and he'll have some really good help. Um, that is the question of how to use a guide safe, safely um, is something I haven't given much thought to personally. Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> I'm going to have to think about it and, and try to, uh, aside from gloves, I'd have, I'll have to think on it to what, what techniques might work um, to make that a little safer. So those are some, some good additional topics to maybe include with, we'll focus on delivery, but also some of the, the other, um, ancillary concerns that you may have uh, as we all try to figure out how to navigate the pandemic and um, keep ourselves and our families safe. Thomas? Yes, sir. Some um, people I do know that use guide safely uh, regarding the corona virus that they use good proper cane techniques and they ask the person who's guiding them just to make some verbal prompts to, so they can follow them. Like if you can keep talking or say something every once in a while or let me know that there's we're coming up to an open hallway or there's a shelf that's sticking out 
that you can't find with your cane that to, to go to do it more verbally, a verbal guide pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a good, a good uh, way to get it done. Um, and to avoid, you know, you don't have to always have contact in every situation. There are some situations you may have, you may have to take someone's elbow and we have to figure out how to address that. But uh, many times just some good directions somebody keeping up a conversation so that you can keep track of where they are when trying to follow them through a crowd like an airport. Um, there may be other tools and techniques such as um, Be My Eyes or, or um, Ira, which are visual assistants where they can give you some uh, guidance using your, using your phone. Um, so there are a couple different options that we can, we can try to touch on uh, and Thomas, as we go. To go back to go to the other question, Yes, about keeping a good distance, you can always wave your cane around, and <laughs> it's your. No. Uh... <laughs> ah. Cane stay on the ground is one of those cardinal rules. If I uh, if I say to wave your cane around at shoulder height, Tony, who taught me O and M, uh, will come and find me, and that won't be good. So, I'm not going to recommend that. But keep using your cane to sort of measure out that distance down on the ground uh, and make sure you don't bump anybody that is closer to you. And if you do, you can step away. Uh, I definitely do that when I'm, when I'm in a line and, so, and things like that. I'll use my cane to try to judge that space. Um, but I'm certainly not, not getting up there and, and waving it around. Um, well, I think we've, we've about taken up our time. Um, I had a, had a few questions, good questions uh, about uh, the next presentation. And I look forward to seeing you guys again. I, pr I won't be here for the next one, but I will be back um, in a month. And we, uh, by the next uh, webinar, that we'll have a topic for that one. We haven't necessarily nailed it down. We always try to have one figured out but be flexible so we can adjust uh, for, the, for the next one out. Um, thank you again to uh, Dr. Miller and Northwest Hills Eye Care. And thank you to um, all the, the leadership of the Austin Lighthouse for letting us have this time to come and speak with you guys um, about different challenges that blind people face. Have a wonderful evening and we'll talk again later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Tony, for the comp compliment. <laughs>